So thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. So uh, first, I would like to thank the organizers for uh, setting up uh, such a nice meeting. So my name is Martin Castelnovo. I'm coming from France uh, in Lyon. And today, I would like to present you some recent works that we, we uh, performed in uh, our group uh, over the last uh, two years. And so they all deal about uh, viral self-assembly. Uh, and I will have two parts. Uh, one part will be uh, more specialized on a single object, namely following the self-assembly of a single capsid, and try to, to understand some, some specific features uh, giving rise to specific shape of viruses. And in the second part, I will try to, to speak about some collective effects, so how uh, a pool of uh, proteins will self-assemble and uh, what is the dyna dynamics uh, associated to this. So as you, after two days of uh, workshop, you, you all uh, know these kind of structures for icosahedral viruses. So uh, they are icosahedral because they have some set of uh, different symmetries. Uh, you, can, you can observe, for example, in these in this, uh, uh, reconstructions here that they range from different sizes, uh, uh, from uh, 20 nanometers to more than 60 nanometers. And uh, an, an idealized uh, view of these structures will be this one, which is a, a, an assembly of, let's say, triangles, where you can identify very easily some hexamers, where six proteins uh, packed together. And you can also identify some pentamers uh, where you have only five proteins at specific locations. So uh, I don't know if somebody uh, explained it, but roughly the T numbers that are uh, used to classify the, the acosahedral viruses are measuring basically the distance between two pentamers on a particular uh, lattice, okay, the lattice of the hexagonal path. But not all viruses have this shape. Some viruses have more irregular shaped and especially elongated shapes. Uh, this is the case, for example, for some retroviruses like HIV here with this famous conical uh, core shape. Uh, RSV, which is another retrovirus, which has this funny coffin-like shape with something that looks flat here and kind of apex uh, at the other side. This one is a bacteriophage, but it looks like an icosahedron that has been stretched. So it's just like an elongated cylinder. And this one, uh, among archaea virus, uh, is called a lemon-shaped virus, which has this very weird shape. And so basically, if we try to understand what is the difference between the, the shape in these viruses, uh, we, we are led to the following conclusion. So, Indeed, in all these structures, uh, either regular or irregular, you can identify hexamers and pentamers. And from topological rule, if you have a surface that you want to close, you must have at least 12, or maximum 12, net pentamers in the structure. So for the regular one, you would say that the, the, the typical feature is that the pentamers are, uh, have the, an equal distance between each other, right? While here, they are kind of phase separated. Uh, here, for example, you, you have seven pentamers. Here, you have five pentamers. This is the same here. And this one, well, this is not a virus. This comes from carbon phases. This is a double nanocone, uh, where you have three on top, three at the bottom, and six at the waist. But you have a total of 12, pentam 12 pentamers. But these pentamers are irregularly placed. So the question I'm asking today is, can we identify what is the property at the level of a single protein that gives rise to this particular shape? How a protein will know that uh, it will end up into an icosahedron or into a, an elongated structure? To do that, we are trying to, uh, to understand the elasticity of uh, these objects and making uh, the, the link between the elasticity and the capsid shape and I'll have some specific discussion about HIV. So this problem has been um, already attacked uh, by numerical simulations, in particular uh, in, in some groups, for example, in a group of Royazandi. Uh, 
And the simplest way to address this, these questions of shape is to have this minimal model uh, where in which, in fact, the building blocks are triangles that are deformable. Those triangles want to share some edge, to have some adhesion. And uh, you must be able to compute some elastic energy for your system, and you try to uh, see, for example, if the, uh, the minimization of elastic energy is able to, to, to reproduce the, the shape you observe. So this is not what I'm going to do uh, today. I'm, I will try to, to, to provide some uh, analytical arguments in order to understand the shape that you observe in such simulations. But so basically, with this model, the elasticity uh, will be composed of two parts. Basically, you will have an uh, in-plane stress, in-plane in stretching or compression of the protein in their own plane. And you will have an out-of-plane uh, curvature as well, which tells you about the bending the local bending of the surface. So in, in, the, in, the, in the discrete model, uh, the bending arises with a potential, uh, a, a kind of quadratic potential around a preferred angle, and this is an important parameter. We introduce uh, some preferred angle, assuming that, in fact, the protein in, by, by itself, if it self-assembles with uh, some other proteins, it wants to have some local curvature. Okay, but at the scale of two proteins, this, this is an angle between the two proteins. And the other potential is just the stretching of the bones, the stretching of the triangle edges, and this just reflects the fact that maybe uh, upon the assembly you will have some compression or stretching. Okay? So, given that you have some spontaneous curvature to your surface, uh, at the, at the, the beginning of the self-assembly, you expect to have some kind of isotropy uh, growth. So you will have a kind of sphere covered by, by triangles. But if you do that uh, with just triangles and preserving the, the, the isotropy, then you, 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 you see that, in fact, uh, the, the triangles that sit on the edge uh, starts to be compressed. Okay? Uh, well, I'm, I'm going to explain uh, in a minute why, but this is exactly the same case if you take a sphere and try to cover the sphere with a flat sheet. If you want to, to cover the, 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 the sphere, you will have to include some folds or wrinkles in the structure. Okay? And this, this, uh, this tells you that you have a too, much, a too large amount of material to cover the sphere. In fact, okay. <clears throat> so we can estimate we can estimate roughly the, the, the cost due to this, uh, uh, this, this growth along a sphere. If you take a disk, for example, uh, and you try to put this disk on the top of a sphere, following the sphere, then the, the rim here will have a reduced value. And you can uh, evaluate for the whole structure. You can evaluate the cost of uh, co confining this disk onto the surface. And you see that this is a strong scaling law because it goes as r to the power 6, so it's a large value. And uh, the, the radius of the sphere uh, comes with r to the power of 4. So it means that at the very beginning of the, the, the growth, there is a huge mechanical stress that is rising up due to the spontaneous curvature. So you have to find ways to reduce this, this stress, this mechanical stress. Well, you can, find, uh, you can find some strategies to reduce this stress by looking at the equations uh, uh, describing the internal stress or the in-plane stress. So this uh, equation, uh, this is one of the equation, one of the focal form of common equation. It is related to the, uh, so the stress tensor which tells you the state of stress inside the thin shell. Uh, you introduce some specific function here, which measure, uh, which measure the stress. And this, th this classical equation is written here. This is one of the two Foppel form of common equations giving the, the equilibrium solutions for uh, the, the shape of, of plates, for example. And it has two source terms. Okay, And these are very important, in fact. So uh, this green source term is the defect density. By defect, uh, 
uh, we mean topological defects, but if we, if we try to understand this in terms of our discrete model, it means that we have some panchamers. So the, the topological defects from continuous theory are just uh, disclinations or panchamers uh, inside the, the structure. And the second term is the Gaussian curvature. So the Gaussian curvature is just the, the product of the two principal curvature of a surface that you can define at any point. And you see that, well, if there were no such terms, in fact, the stress will be minimal. Okay? So in a sense, you, by just writing this equation, you identify two strategies in order to relax the stress. The first one is that, well, if you have Gaussian curvature, then you have to induce defects in order to compensate, so to have a minimal state of stress. That's one strategy. And that, that would be the strategy called the defect inclusion or penchamer inclusion through the assembly again. The other strategy is to have no defects and no Gaussian curvature. But still, you want to have some curvature, but you can have such a curvature by taking a cylinder or cone, for example, which has a vanishing uh, Gaussian curvature. And you will end up with some cylinders, cylinders that, that has been seen in, in, uh, in simulations uh, in a group of Hoyazandi, for example, uh, uh, simulations very similar to this, uh, the, the model I described before. So can we estimate the cost of defect inclusion and to see how is it better than just having this, uh, this uh, isotropic growth? So in fact, including a, a, a defect or a panchamer in a solution amounts to perform such an operation. Here you have a, a network of hexagons and you will cut out a wedge of 60 degrees and then you try to glue the thing. You try to glue the both parts. If you do that, if you stay flat, well, you expect to have to pay a strong stretching price, right? But if you go to 3D, in fact, very easily, uh, you are able to, to form a cone, in fact. And so the different cost here. So here, if you stay flat, you don't have the bending energy, but you have the stretching, which goes like the, the area of the, the the disk you are considering. Now, if you uh, perform buckling and have a cone, then you see that you just have a logarithmic growth, which is much more affordable uh, in terms of uh, mechanical stress. So pay attention. This is a zero spontaneous curvature calculation that we can make for non-zero uh, uh, spontaneous curvature. But it's more complicated. Uh, so with one defect, indeed, we can reduce the state of stress. But if you keep on going the growth, you expect to have to maybe include more defects. And we will we'll come up to this point in a minute. If you include more defects or more pentamers, in fact, you see that you will curve more and more the structure. Okay? More precisely, for example, uh, here you have one defect, uh, two, three, four, five. And why? Uh, from a geometric argument, is it favorable to have multiple defects in order to, to, to have a, the, the less, a less amount of stress? Well, uh, recall that, in fact, uh, by going from the disk to the sphere, the rim was reduced, the rim length was reduced. But if you just include one defect, you are performing such a thing. You are reducing the rim length because you removed this part. Okay, so you can compute the, num the, the, the length that you remove from your system in order to cover up the sphere, okay, by adding, uh, by adding more, more defects. Uh, and so, in fact, this length reduction is easier uh, in order to follow the curvature of the sphere. So for the other uh, for the other uh, possibility, other strategy to reduce the mechanical stress, well, you just have to pay bending energy because here you don't have any stretching. If I take a, a flat sheet of paper, I can roll it without any tearing, stretching, or uh, compressing. And you see that it goes uh, like the, the, the area of the, of the surface, and you have also the, the radius of spontaneous curvature that, that comes up. So, more or less, what we have is that if we start from this, uh, if we start from this structure with isotropic growth on only hexagons, if you are at high spontaneous curvature, you would expect to have 
at first one pentamers, but then you have a cascade of pentamers and you end up with an icosahedron. And if you are on the other side, that for the weak spontaneous curvature, then you expect to have a cylinder that will grow indefinitely, and you don't have to include any defects. So th this is a problem for a virus because it needs to be closed. But we'll, we'll see, uh, we'll comment about that in a minute. So more precisely, for example, uh, you, you can compute, for example, in the high uh, spontaneous curvature scheme, you can compute, for example, the energy without any defects. This is this blue curve. And with the 12 defects, this is this red curve. And in between, you see that there is a cascade that the more you add defects, the better it is in order to follow the structure. Okay? And you reach, eventually, icosahedral symmetry. On the, other, on the other side, if you have a small curvature, uh, and you compare, for example, this is the energy with the 12 uh, defects. You compare with cylinders, you see that depending on the radius of the cylinders, sometimes you have a smaller energy by going to the cylinders instead of having the, 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 the defects. And so you observe these uncapped cylinders. And in between, and we, we identify some typical scaling for the, the, the typical radius of spontaneous curvature, you expect to have intermediate shapes that are strongly dependent on the way you, you self-assemble. So indeed, with this continuous calculation, you, you, you are able to explain why, in the simulations of Roya, for example, for small radius of, uh, small radius of spontaneous curvature, you expect to have this icosahedron, and on the other side, you have the, the cylinders. So I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to, to comment now on the special case of HIV. So uh, uh, some experiments have been performed quite a long time ago into the self-assembly of just CA, which is the part, uh, which is the protein that makes up the conical core in HIV. And depending on the presence of the genome or not, uh, cylinders were quite often observed, right? Now, if you look at uh, cones inside uh, particles that are produced inside cells, uh, well, you make an interesting correlation as well. Most of the time you observe some cones, but sometimes you observe some cylinders, but the genome is outside here. The cylinder here, the genome is outside. Okay. So this raised the possibility that, in fact, in order to answer the question, how would you close your surface if you have uh, an infinite cylinders, maybe this is the interaction with the genome that uh, induces the, the defects. So we, we started to, uh, to, to make some simulations, and this is an ongoing work. But indeed, if you take a surface that wants to grow separately without any interactions with something else, if it wants to grow just like a cylinder, if you perform the growth in the presence of an attractive sphere, then you are able to induce the presence of punch tremors. So you change uh, the way the surface wants to grow. And so we started to, to have kind of phase diagram, but this is very rough, basically, with the addition energy and the, the, the ratio between the spheres and the spontaneous curvature. And you expect to have some phases where you don't have any addition, some phases where you have complete covering, and in some phases you observe some, some cones, for example. So this, this will end my first part uh, about the single object. And the main conclusion is that at the level of a single protein, this is really the spontaneous curvature. So at a very local scale, this is the spontaneous curvature that will determine the shape you will end up if you would have uh, rather icosahedron or, um, or more elongated shape. And uh, importantly, it seems that uh, for the case of HIV, but maybe for other viruses as well, uh, the interaction of the growing protein surface with something else, it could be the genome or it could be the outer membrane for HIV, for example, is susceptible to give rise to pentamers in order to close the structures. So now I move to the, to the second part. We are going to look at uh, many intermediates now, not just one particle. And we are going to, 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 focus, uh, to focus specifically on one type of self-assembly that is found for HIV, again, which is uh, what we call the open self-assembly. Uh, 
so it means that, in fact, you have a self-assembly scheme where you have some proteins that want to uh, minimize their overall energy by associating. But there is a source of monomer, and there is an uh, outflux of complete particles. Okay, so this is not a closed uh, self-assembly would, would be just this case, right? But here you have an entry and an exit in your system. Uh, the fact that you have an entry and an exit will all you, allow you to reach eventually some stationary state, okay? So we, we try to, to, to understand the dynamics of uh, such a self-assembly scheme. And so the idea to do that is to write down the kinetic equations. Uh, and so basically, we have a pool of monomer, which is fed externally by constant flux. We have the self-assembly, and the pool of monomer couples to all these reactions, because you, uh, we consider a, a monomer addition model. And the last step is irreversible, because you, you, you lose the, the complete particle. So the interesting quantity to consider in order to understand what is going on is the local flux, which tells you if locally you are going forward or backward. And you have also the, the detail balance. And the interesting, um, so there is an, also an interesting phenomenon is that you expect to have some line tension in your system. Because you grow uh, your system, there, there is a, a border between the particle that is growing and the rest of the membrane, for example. So you expect to have a, a, a some barrier, energetic barrier. And this energetic barrier, in fact, uh, is the net effect of this energetic barrier is coupled to the monomer populations. This is this graph here. This is the height of the energetic barrier. This is the number, the size of the intermediate you compute. And you see that depending on the, the monomer population, you are able to modulate the height and the width of, the, um, of, the, of this barrier. And this will have some strong consequences on the, on the assembly, on the dynamics. So if you solve numerically the equations I just showed, you will end up with a profile like this. So these are different profiles. So this is the, the size distribution as function for different time. And you see that, in fact, you have some assembly waves with, with uh, some, some parts. Uh, of intermediates which are re relatively well localized. Okay, so you have a propagation of a kind of front, and in fact, you sorry, uh, well, uh, it's well, it's hidden more or less in the in the effective in the effective parameters. Uh, the the bending energy will will come up in this. Uh, in this epsilon, this is the net energy you gain by forming the by forming the intermediate, and if you have bending energy for the membrane, you lower this this net energy. Okay. This is an energy gain. Okay. So if you if you bend, you uh, you expect to to uh, lose to lose something. So the gain will be smaller. We can discuss this afterwards if you want. So the interesting point is that, well, uh, the, the monomers that you have in the solution, they, have, they are used uh, by two, two, uh, two processes. The first process is to nucleate an intermediate, right? We call this nucleation. And there is an elongation, which, is, uh, which amounts to grow the intermediate you just nucleated. And the monomers have to share between uh, classes that will nucleate or elongate. And here, for example, if you compute along the time, so uh, these are rescale units, uh, but if you compute on, on the time, you compare, for example, the elongation current here, which is roughly constant, but there is a slight drop here. To the nucleation current, you see that nucleation current is strongly localized. So you nucleate a whole bunch of intermediates, but then you stop nucleating. And then the thing travels. And that's why you observe these assembly waves here. <clears throat> For example, if you look at, at the outcome, this is the flux outside. Uh, so you expect to have, as an outcome, as, uh, if, if you measure the number of particles that are emitted by, by the, this cell, for example, 
you expect to have uh, some can what what we call viral burst. It means that uh, for some time you have a strong production of full particles, but then you have a lower production, then a stronger production, then a lower production, before reaching eventually some stationary state where you you have this kind of production. Uh, so we don't have really uh, experimental evidence uh, as precise as the, the these predictions. But if you look, for example, at cells that are uh, producing, uh, producing uh, that are infected and producing uh, HIV, for example, uh, you, you see sometimes uh, you see uh, area like this where you, you seem to have all the particles in the same state. Here you don't have particles with few few proteins. You see mainly particles with many proteins that are almost closed. Okay, so that that goes to, to uh, that that fits well at least qualitatively with this kind of uh, prediction. But uh, we expect to have more uh, more experimental data. So the, this is really related to the to the presence of 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 the barrier here. In fact, this barrier depends the the the, the height of the barrier depends on the monomer population, and so as the monomer uh, are uh, um, are uh, divided between monomers that will nucleate and will grow, eventually you see that here. The elongation is almost constant, but this is the nucleation which is highly localized, meaning that here, for example, if I look at an intermediate time, let's say 400, which is the uh, violet here, you see that, well, you have something which is localized because you, you stopped nucleating. You just you use all, almost all the monomers to propagate because you have a high barrier. You cannot nucleate anymore. And these, these are on the other side of the barrier, and they will propagate. Uh, <clears throat> and you have also an interesting comparison. If you want to compare the, what, what I define as the open self-assembly with a one-shot self-assembly. So what is a one-shot self-assembly? So suppose you perform the open self-assembly for a certain time. And remember, you, we, we have an influx of monomer. So if you count the total number of monomers you fed in your system, you could try the following experiments. Take this number and plug all the monomers at the same time zero, and then you stop uh, uh, putting monomers. <coughs> and you see that the dynamics are very different, in fact. So th this is, uh, again, the, the color height gives you the size distribution. You have the time, you have the size here. And you see that, in fact, if you all monomers are provided in one shot, then you have a, a, a a large number of nuclei, but you have no more monomers to propagate them. So you have to disassemble, or wait for disassemble, or to recycle in order to propagate. So if you make a quantitative comparison between the two kind of self-assembly, so let's say, for example, uh, that we are going to compare the two self-assembly at time 10,000, OK? So with a flux one at time 10,000, it means that I can plug at the very beginning 10,000 uh, effective monomers because these are reduced units. And so if you compare the black curve and the red curve, you see that in the experiments where you provided all the monomers at once, you have, at a given time, you have a, a, a much less efficient production. If you provide the monomers by constant flux, but small flux, then you have you are able to go faster than if you provide all the monomers together. So that, that's an interesting uh, uh, prediction. And again, the, the reason is that you have to recycle uh, for the one-shot self-assembly. You have to recycle because you, 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 you created so many uh, nuclei that you don't have any more monomer to propagate them. So you have to disassemble some nuclei in order to make some of them progress. And this, this makes you the pro this process, which has been called in the literature a kind of kinetic trap, is indeed smaller. So I arrive to the, to the conclusion to this part. And just in order to summarize, uh, 
so for this open self-assembly problem, uh, the presence of an energetic barrier is very important because it gives you this particular dynamics in the form of assembly waves. Uh, and if you look at just the out the, the output of uh, virus production, you expect to have some burst, okay? Not continuous production, but some burst uh, before reaching eventually some stationary state. And uh, the interesting prediction as well might be that, well, if you want to perform an experiment of self-assembly uh, uh, by using the standard physical chemist way, you put all the monomers together, Maybe if you try to, to put some flux of monomers, you might enhance the, the, the speed of the reaction. Okay. And so with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. And yes, I, was, I, I would like to thank some collaborators, in particular, Vladimir uh, Lorman. Thank you. <laughs>